it's the dynamic, emotional dynamic around people who are depressed is they never get to it. They never want to experience that thing that caused them to be depressed. So what is it? I think it's mainly, I know we have like, when everybody dies, like, like I know Tyler talks about legacy. I think my biggest fear is I'm going to leave and there's not going to be a person at my funeral. Okay. So I didn't leave a legacy. First, I want everybody witnessing this to forgive me up front. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you. Who cares? Well, I do. No, you don't. I guess I'm not following. I know. You don't care. If you cared, then you would. Change. Yep. That's what's depressing. But you didn't answer my question. Because depression wants to never address what happened. It wants to talk around it. It wants to get the listeners emotionally involved with something else so that the person doesn't have to address what happened. You see where he went with that? It's just what happens with depressing people. Not that you're depressing. Well, some people say I am. <laughs> Only if they're depressing themselves. So Joe doesn't see you as that. Otherwise, he wouldn't be around you. The sole reason why I remain friends with Joe is that condition. He only surrounds himself, like he said, with those people. So he sees something, and he's going to keep seeing it while you don't. So what happened? that caused you to be there. Don't put this on national TV. If everybody would have a seat, except for one of our honored guests, Tom Shea. I know you just sat down. Those old knees, now you're going to stand up again. <laughs> and his daughter, Autumn, if she would rise. So. Guys, one of the things that we do is we give credit where credit's due. Um, we talked today about those 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence and what it meant to mutually together pledge their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor. We talked about we talked about what that meant. We talked about what they gave up. And as I was introducing Tom today, I was certain beyond a shadow of a doubt that had he been born in a different time, his name would have been on that document. Only 30% of America were patriots. And only 5% of those showed up to fight. You heard him today talk about what he did, where he was, the decisions he had to make. <clears throat> you guys have read his book. He literally didn't write the book for you because he doesn't care what you think. He wrote the book 
because he wasn't sure he was going to get to teach her the lessons he had to teach her. Why? He didn't think he was coming back. He didn't think he was going to get to raise his own daughter. And so now, I want everyone to toast not only the first generation that served our country, but now at West Point, his daughter, the second generation that's serving our country. So if you'd rise and toast both of them. Here, here. Here, here. Now let's eat, drink, and be merry. <laughs> For tomorrow we die. <laughs> In support of this declaration with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge our lives, our fortune, and our sacred honor. That's how it's often misquoted. What it actually says was that for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other. You know when I signed that thing? It was just 56 dudes sitting in a room. And it was a commitment. And then to watch how they carried it out, that's how I want to live my life. With that level of commitment, that's unbelievable. And, and when I read that, I thought, and most of them gave up their fortunes, their honor was ruined, gave up their families, their homes. I mean, how easy would it have been to compromise? How easy? How easy would it have been to compromise? <clears throat> and, and I think they looked at each other and they went, this is what we're going to do. And, and so often, it's the case where people tell you what they're going to do, and how different is what they actually do from what they say. So a couple things. One, that's the type of organization I want to be. That's the type of people I want to be around. I want to be around people that are that honorable. That when they say something's going to happen, it flat happens, right? And then I want you to know that you are going to have to declare independence in your own life. Every single one of us has things in chains that is keeping you from moving ahead. Every person in this room. Every single one of us. We have things that are keeping us from those bucket list items we talked about last night. Every single one of us. And so when are you going to declare independence from those things? When are you going to take back control? You can be in the face of insurmountable odds and you'll still make it. You'll still win. You'll still overcome. The greatest empire in the world at that time. And 56 guys were like, <laughs> not here, not us. It's pretty cool. And that's the heritage where we all came from. So I ask again, where, where are those guys? Where are those ladies at? Right? I think we're sitting in a room with some in them. We're sitting in a room with some of them. But I know for a fact when I when I started asking myself where are those people, I know for a fact that Tom Shea is one. He would have been there signing that document. Actually, he probably would have. King George would have woke up and Tom Shea would have been sleeping beside him. <laughs> and, would have, and, would have, and, would have, and would have already slit his throat. <laughs> you know? um, but I know for a fact, man, that he's a man of honor and principles. And, you know, when you've heard him talk, because he came to talk, how many of you have heard him? So when you heard him talk the first time, and he said every mission that he went on, 
They ran out of food and water and ammunition and options. What happens when there's no options, no food, no water, you're out of ammo, and you're surrounded? I guess that'll test if what if you're going to do what you said you're going to do, right? He did something right because he's still here, <laughs> and and so I know that I know that those men still exist, and I'm striving to be that guy, and I want to help you understand that you can be that person. You can be that person. You can have that type of integrity. When you tell somebody something, you do it. You honor your word, as he talked about. And he's going to talk about emotions, because emotions is a powerful thing. And I sat, Amanda and I sat with him, I don't even know if it was 30 minutes or two hours, because I let time go when I'm with him. I'm like, I love this dude and everything he says. But when you learn to understand your emotions, as he's going to explain today, it changed my life sitting in there talking to him. Didn't he hear us, Amanda? Mm -hmm. That's when we were both like, oh, yeah, oh, my daughter's here, so I'm trying not to cuss as much. Yeah, yeah, I've only dropped one F on, right? So far. <laughs> I read a text she said one time and it was full of explicatives and I was like, where did you learn that? She was like, really? <laughs> <laughs> but that, that is what I'm excited about. I can't wait to learn from him. I can't wait to go deeper into this. Because every single one of us, you're going to have issues and your issues get surrounded by those emotions and those emotions blind you from ever solving them. I guarantee you to run around the same tree over and over and over and over. You ever feel like you have to go around the same problem again and again and again in your life? Get ready for that to be snapped into today. It doesn't have to be that way anymore. Isn't that great? But you know what? You can choose to keep running around that tree if you want to after today, but I'm just telling you, you're getting ready to get the key not to. Right? And uh, I am a lot calmer since we had that meeting problem. I'll play a little bit. I mean, I'm not strong anyway. Um, but, uh, I don't know what more I can say about him. You guys have read his bio, 23-year Navy SEAL. Um, his book, he read his book, Unbreakable. We've done the 24-hour walk with him. He's a true friend to our organization. So I want to welcome Tom Shea up here. We love you, man. If you cry, I'm not going to walk away from you because emotions cause a lot of things to come up and if they come up, they come up. So I'm just, that's my bottom line up front. I've done this 10 times in the past about three weeks. Not this long, but I've had to go into organizations and teach what I call emotional quotient or emotional mastery because unless you understand how emotions or what emotions are and what they're designed to do, you're kind of stuck. And maybe that's the shit that uh, was discussed up front. Your emotions cause you to smell like shit and you love it, so. Okay, so. <clears throat> I'm just gonna jump in. So this is a Q and A. It's designed to be a Q and A. It's gonna be in three parts. A little storytelling. I'm gonna tell you a story of mine so that I can put my uh, authenticity on the table and then happy to interrupt me whenever I get to a point you, that's not clear. And then we're going to have an interaction. And then I want to talk, if you will, about your specific part in your business or holistically the business of consolidated assurance and how emotions are a play there. And then we'll end it in another Q&A. That's how it seems to work from my vantage point. And what Joe had said earlier is uh, I spent a lot of time in the SEAL teams. And in the SEAL teams, if you haven't heard about that, you've probably seen it on TV. And for some reason, they just put me on TV recently. 
uh, I was interviewed about four years ago about some sniper missions and some other missions that I was on and I didn't think they were going to do anything with it. It would have been nice in the first year when the book came out, but now it's late. So, <laughs> so uh, uh, Navy SEALs are people who are unique. They're unique in the fact that they commit to something prior to knowing how it's going to happen. They commit to going into the SEAL program. And I want you to imagine this. You're going to commit to going into a program that has 91% attrition rate per startup class, 91%. And you're gonna to commit to that. Who in the room would commit to going into something where nine out of 10 of your brothers and sisters you know aren't gonna make it? Think about that. Think about if you were coming into Joe's program where you knew up front that, you know, count 10 people, nine of them weren't going to make it. Think about, wow, that's an interesting culture. Probably nobody would commit to that. I would rather commit to something knowing that I was going to be fostered and nurtured, and if, if I stay with the program, it's going to be successful. That's the opposite there. So they make people commit to something that is going to destroy nine people, and then they're going to put you through a, a designed effect on human nature that is only intended to break you down. And then people commit, like I was the one of the dummies that committed. Didn't you commit like five times? Yeah, well, I tried to commit five times. So, <laughs> so I went in thinking I wanted to be a Navy SEAL. Like, you probably came into this organization thinking that it was going to be one thing, and then it was something else. Is that true for most people? Okay. So I thought it was going to be really exciting, it was going to be fun, the people were going to be happy, and it was going to be a great culture to grow up in, and then I showed up, and it was not that. And then on day one, 20% of the class quits. It took them two years to get there. On day one, 20% go away. And me experiencing that as a young man, I was like, okay, this is serious. Just uh, observing it, it became very serious. Having, going through it, the first day is so physically difficult that you look at the next day and go, there's no way I can do it. The reason why I bring that up is, as you learn to commit before you know a solution, the person that you are, if you commit without knowing a solution, is much stronger than the person who needs a solution to be committed. That's what today is kind of going to help you unravel. I don't think that looks Chinese, but <laughs> declare before there is a solution. The actual effect of the word declaration on your psyche is you declare using words that you are the person that's going to be there at the end. The Declaration of Independence was de the declaration that they were going to be independent prior there to there being any possibility of independence. This is a rare aspect in human nature. A declaration that you're going to solve a problem before you know the solution. It's like I want to be a millionaire while holding the sign on the street saying we'll work for food. That person who can declare in the face of adversity is an entirely unique human being. So declare before you know how to solve it. My question is why? Why is that true? That the person who says something before they have a solution, why is that person stronger than the person who needs a solution before they commit? I've not heard that answer. What was the other one? Determination. Determination. What was that? Okay. It causes so if I say I'm going to get across that street, 
before I know how to walk, how many solutions become available to get across? A bunch. So if I wait for somebody to give me the bridge and the training to get across, do you see the difference? How long is it going to take for you to find the solution if you're waiting for it? Forever. Forever. Which lends itself to this emotional conversation that we're going to have. What stops people after they're committed or before they're committed? Discouragement. From where? Fear. Yeah. Inside. Your minds, your emotions, your thoughts. Not knowing. Fear. Does not knowing make any significant difference? I think it's by the fear. I think not knowing is the one. If I don't know, so if I say I'm going to go sell, I, I, I use you a lot, Tyler, sorry. So, and you don't know this, so, so. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Tyler, I, I love watching Tyler and, and seeing what he does like from a third party, because I don't know all the day-to-day -day stuff that he does, even though he, he puts it on public display. Uh, he sells a ton of policies. From my vantage point, I don't know what you all look at it as, but he, he's ravenous. So be, how does somebody do that is what I'm interested in when other people can't. What does he have to overcome that the rest of us get caught in. Well, would you wait a second? <laughs> so, so like I'm all in. I got to yeah. <laughs> Put insurance down and we'll get there. So, <laughs> so he said he's going to sell 100 policies before he'd sold 100 policies. And the whole community or the whole world says you can't do that in a day or a week or whatever the metric was. How does it happen when, if nobody else says it, it's possible, how does somebody go, that's what I'm going to do before I know how to do it? My, I would be able to ask Tyler this, did you know how to do it before you did it? I knew the steps that were involved, but I didn't know what it was going to look like to get there. Right. So you know, with training, you're like, okay, like even shooting, I know how to shoot, but I don't know how rapidly I can do it. I, you know, test myself to the nth degree. I know what I've been trained to do, but I don't know how to go from selling one policy to 100. Maybe it's the right steps. So how do I commit to that? So what stops most people from committing? I, I want to interfere with this. I don't know, so please answer this. How many have you sold in a day? 32. What's the difference between 32 and 100, other than the freaking number? <laughs> What's this gap? Effort. Belief is effort the way that he just described it. What else, what's the other, what else exists between here and here? Desire. Desire. Want to? Want to? Problems. problems. Unforeseen problems. Unforeseen problems. On, it's, there's a saying in the SEAL teams, probably in business, but it's easy to make money when there's money available in the SEAL teams. It's easy to be a SEAL on a sunny day, except there ain't many sunny days once you're through training. That's a problem. So I, I anticipated it to be fun, and then all of a sudden it wasn't like in the first moment, which is probably sales. Like, this is going to be great. I've encouraged. Joe's all encouraging, and then I go try to sell, and somebody says, you're an idiot. Oh, that's a problem. Agreed? Okay. So... This gap is what I'm interested in. Uh, this is cool, and this is also cool. 
but the gap to go from where you are to here is a series of overcoming problems. So problems and emotions are twins. Please write that one down. Is there a better to put that milk on there or whatever it is? I'm not sure if it's milk. I'll do that. I'll do it. You keep talking. What do you got? I've done that like three times. That could be the reason why it's that It just took off all the nice slick stuff. <laughs> I'll just use that rag and it'll work next time. Okay, so here's the truth that most people don't realize. As I'm going to teach, I'm going to we're going to talk about emotions today with a series of conversations and stories. <clears throat> but you have to know up front, emotions and problems arise simultaneously. You never will have an emotional response without encountering a problem. It's impossible. They're not separate. So anytime you're feeling emotional, if you want to call it that way, is because you are currently in experiencing or anticipating a problem. So problems and emotions arise at the same time. So I'll tell you a story so you can understand what I'm saying. <clears throat> a story from combat, not that you'll be able to understand the combat story. So in 2009, I was a platoon chief. I took 21 other SEALs into Afghanistan, and we were at month two. We were going to go on a mission deep in the mountains of Afghanistan and go after, there were actually more, there, we were taking 58 SEALs. We were going against 140 enemy. We knew there were at least 140 because we counted them. And you understand the technology that is available to be able to do that. So we knew that there were 140, a little bit more. There's some women and kids on target. And we were to go in there, and everybody understands what SEALs do. We shake hands and kiss babies, but we don't. So we, we don't do that. So we, we know we're going in the harm's way. It was their big training camp. And... That wasn't a problem. Why is going into combat for a SEAL not a problem? Because you've been trained to do it. You already have the solution to that. What was the problem that we faced? Numbers. What was that? Women and children. Numbers. Numbers is not a problem. <laughs> Numbers is not a problem. You know why numbers is not a problem? Because every man has around 100 rounds on him. So two guys can handle that problem, theoretically. So what's the problem? There's a difference between a problem and emotion, but what's the problem? This is a very, I, I like this conversation because it's hard for people to flesh out. That's why I'm letting it flesh itself out. What was the problem that we faced Like what? Like what? Train, if we do it, it wasn't a problem. What was the problem that we faced? Uncertainty. What's the first thing that happens when you start doing your mission or, or doing sales that is uncertain? Okay, here we go. Human are a problem. Do we have agreement? <laughs> we are a problem to ourselves and to the people around us. What's the other problem? I'll show you the emotional attachment there, but what's the other identifiable problem? Problems are tangible. Emotions are not. Because you'll never be able to prove to somebody else other than you, that, you're, that emotions are real. 
Crying is tangible. Emotion behind the cry is different. So what other problems did we face going into combat? Humans do, but so another human problem? What other problems do you particularly face when you go and do business? Communication. What's another problem? Weather. They're always unforeseen. Problems are most of the time unforeseen. Here's why it's a problem that is unforeseen is the real problem. Because if I teach you how to do something, like if at first, if you, you're, you're brand new to the, to the business, you don't even know what the product is. Before you know what the product is, the product is a problem. Once you know what the product is, it's no longer a problem. Everybody agree with that? Yes. So I'm talking about all the unforeseen things, either in your business or in combat. Humans are an unforeseen problem because all of a sudden, you don't, you anticipated one response from them that's programmed, and then they give you something else. So that, oh God, here we go. You, you follow what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Communications are a problem when what you anticipate is not what they give back. Like trying to make a phone call, it's, it's, it's linear pro progression. I make a phone call, I get a response. What happens when that's a problem? I made a phone call and I got shit. But damn, that now becomes a problem unless I've encountered it a bunch of times. So great salesmen hear a no on a, on sales wimp people, sorry. A great salesperson hears a no. Is it a problem to that person? No, because they've overcome this 152 times. To the first time somebody says no, you're, I'm done. So that's an unforeseen problem. I'm just showing you what problems are first, because if I don't show you this, it becomes a problem. <laughs> what is another problem that I would have faced from your point of view? Well, they're not knowing what you told them. I will just, we'll put it down there. The unknown. To me as a leader, this is the biggest issue the stuff that I don't know that I don't know about. Because all you do in planning is try to make things known. Try to go identify every significant thing that you, have to, you know you're going to have to do. Like get a flight to Miami, get a flight to Denver. I, once I solve all the known problems, then I get a little more rich experience of being able to be successful. It's these are the biggest issue, the unknowns. The unknowns in communication, the unknown factor of the human dynamic. So when these problems arise, emotions arise at the same time. They always arise at the same time. So, and this is the fun dynamic of this. So we land in Afghanistan. We're four miles from the target. We didn't anticipate what? Because we've done our analysis. If we land way out there, they're not going to know we're coming. So what happened when we landed that was unknown? We're under, fire. under fire right when we landed. There was a problem for how many seconds? No, not, not really until we realized what it was. It's a problem because you didn't anticipate it, and there's a big emotional response. And then you go, oh, okay, they're shooting at us. Once you figure that out, then you have a myriad of solutions available. Until you figure that out, you're in an emotional stat state of, I call shit, so. What was my emotional response? No, that's a solution to a problem. Big difference. Frustration. Frustration is an emotion. Fear. 
What was your emotional response when I said that I was getting shot at? Because you looking it through your lens. Oh shit. Confusion. Confusion. Why the intel didn't say y'all had to get into that? Thought you did everything. Thought you did all the research, and then next thing you know, you fired at. The way you just described it looks like this to me. Anger is an emotional it's response. Like a job, you think, yeah. Well, Pissed. You know yeah. That was mine. Pissed. Most people don't get that. So, Fear gets crushed in SEAL training. If you are have an emotional response of fear while going through training, you get weeded out so quickly that it makes your head spin. And I'll, t I'll describe what fear is. Frustration is what emotion? Describe frustration to me. No, they are uniquely different, and I'll show you. Frustration is what? Confusion. Right? I feel like when I'm frustrated, it, it's because I can't control what situation I feel like I should be able to control. Loss of control. Yeah. What else is with frustration and disappointment? Anxiety. That's actually a different one. If I could spell, I would be a millionaire. <clears throat> okay, now that you have, you're beginning to see that there's a distinct difference between emotion and problems. They're different. I can tell you that everybody in the world thinks they're the same. Not saying that you're everybody. Everybody thinks this is the problem. It's weird. Most people deal with problems by dealing with their emotions. If you're dealing with frustration, fear, anger, and anxiety, are you solving the problem? Do you see how weird that becomes? So t the twins arise, I deal with the emotional response to it, because then if I'm dealing with my emotions, I cannot solve the problem. It makes it impossible to solve the problem. You can't. It's impossible. It's never going to work. Because emotions, I want you to look at it this way. Emotions are a key. You hold a big fat key ring, and on that key ring are all your emotions possible as a response. You carry it with you like you're a master, except that the key ring is invisible to you and the keys just pop in and turn on the lock without your knowing it. Okay, so as you know, all keys kind of have, I'll just draw a big skeleton key. So Tom, yes. really quick, you say that emotion, if you're dealing with your emotions, you can't solve the problem. You can't. But and I'll show you why, but yeah, please go ahead. So the part that's confusing me, you felt anger. The problem is, is you're getting shot at. You're pissed that you're killing people. You solve, you're solving the problem while you're dealing with your anger. Keep that in mind as I talk about what I'm about ready to talk about. Okay. I'm having an emotional response. The emotion that comes up has a particular predetermined outcome. That's what I'm about ready to talk about. All emotions are, I'm just going to use this analogy so that every, so this being a didactic conversation now. All emotions are a key. The key has those little cogs in it, blah, blah, blah. So every key, when you put it into a lock, that's why some keys don't work in locks, is when you turn it, if it doesn't grab the right cog, if you will, won't open the lock. But this lock that you have is your life. Every key you put in it will turn something on or off. So every key when put into this notional lock will turn it on. It has a predetermined outcome. Every emotion has a design to it. That is the undiscovered country. Every emotion that you have 
has a particular outcome that it's designed to help you unfold, except you're probably using the wrong emotion, which is weird. All right, so. Yes. One emotion that we haven't mentioned, and I, I know some crazy nut jobs in situations like this that might actually be excited. One sit beside me. <laughs> so, I actually wanted to say the excited, but I didn't want to sound. <laughs> it, I just emotions are just look at it at this point in time. No emotion is appropriate. They all have predetermined outcomes. Which one are you going to pick? So if you have a certain response and you don't know how to control emotions, you've now turned on that law or that key. And if you're not particularly designing that key or that emotion, it's going to take you that direction. All right, so what is the ultimate outcome of frustration and lo lo loss of control? Where is that leading? Where does frust... Sorry? Frustration is a male thing. Having... I, I, I may be wrong, and I've been wrong about a thousand times. <laughs> But what I've seen in doing this work, solely dedicated to co the conversation of emotional mastery, is that men have frustration, women don't normally. And my, my numbers aren't massive, but around 600 people having gone through this conversation, intimate one-on-one -on -one conversation, women do not have that normal frustration response. They have other ones. So, and if you are a woman and you have a frustration response, then you understand this. So frustration and leads to loss of control 100% of the time, but it leads somewhere else. Lack of action. What was that? Lack of action. Oh, not really. Frustration. So what happens to frustration? You're frustrated with what? Anybody want to go through a... A, a personal experience? Result. Other, other than you, does anybody else want to go through okay. a one-on-one? -on -one? Yeah, go ahead. We, um, what are you frustrated with? So frustration, the problem is what? The problem through frustration, what happens with frustration is people cannot identify the problem anymore. They're, caught They're caught in a loop. The problem is terrible. What is the problem? How to get out of it. I'm asking you, what's the problem? The problem is, the problem is that I didn't get what I wanted. Having expectations. The problem okay. is. So you didn't get what you want. Solve that. So the problem is that, I don't know what the solution is. I don't know what the problem is. The, well, the problem is y'all going to shut out. Y'all going to shut out. That's the well, problem. Well, the solution is for somebody who is, is, smarter than me in the area of the logistical part, legal part, to get involved and speak to their leadership and work it out. Okay, I'll give you an analogy. It's, so I'm making you look at the mirror about two inches away from the mirror. Everybody else is going to be able to solve this but you, normally. You wanted to shoot and hit the X. Where did it go? Okay. okay. So it hit here. Okay. So what's the solution? I got to realign and hit that target. I got to get my sights right. Okay. Are they right? Well, I think so. Okay. So <laughs> your your sights are right. Yeah. Okay. So I readjusted. So did you shoot again? Yeah, I'm shooting again. Yes, I shot again. So this is like current. Right now, like Monday okay. morning. We're waiting on Good. Big Dog to help us out. And he's on it. So Monday. He is not needed. Not needed. Okay. Okay. You're still frustrated. And you're, you're waiting for a solution. Mm -hmm. You caused the problem. He didn't cause it. And I know 
I don't even have to know that. As long as you're frustrated, you're in a loop. What aren't you committed to right now when you're frustrated? There's always a solution. solution. Well, not really. So you're commit when you're frustrated, you're frustrated with this. Agreed? <clears throat> and you want a solution to get here. You're still frustrated with that. Until you realize what happened that caused that, a solution can't bring you to center. You can't wipe this away because you're still frustrated with it. What caused this? Your relationship wasn't strong enough to keep out the resistance. You missed something. You, you did. Or collectively, y'all missed something. Until you figure that out, you can't get to center because you're going to apply a solution into another unknown. So you, you, here's what will happen. You'll hit here. But there's something that's missing in frustration that is very, you have to get it. What don't you want? What happened? As long as you don't want what happened, you'll always be frustrated. I'm just seeing if it hits that way. I can say it differently. So how do you cure frustration? Want what happened. Want what happened. You have to. You have not accept this type of acceptance. Accept what happened. Meaning acknowledge what happened. The moment you acknowledge what happened, what can you do with what happened? Find out all those data points. Oh shit, we missed it. We missed it. We totally missed something. Once you, the, the bullet hit here, you could be frustrated. And having taught snipers, everybody wants an X and then they never get it. But the bullet went somewhere. And he shot the bullet there. So you have to figure out what's happening with the individual that causes that happening. Well, I wanted to go to center. What caused that? They have to acknowledge what they are doing that causes things. Once they're in that dynamic of cause, effect, cause, effect, frustration dies. I shoot two inches to the right all the time. Cool. What can you do with that? Go like this with your scope. Keep doing whatever you're doing. Just do that. We can correct maybe. But if you're constantly hitting off because you're missing stuff, and you're, well, I keep doing A, B, and C, and it's hitting here, then that's knowing what you are in the matter of what's happening. Accepting that. Once you accept it, you can solve it. Until you accept it, you're still doing those things. So if you go to the uppers and ask them to solve this problem, you're still doing A, B, and C. This is your shooting platform. You're looking at the X and it keeps hitting to the right. And you're asking somebody to help you until you figure out that this is going on. You can aim this way if you want, or you can solve it by teaching somebody something else. But either way, you've got to acknowledge what's actually going on. When that happens, frustration dies. And it dies every single time. But frustrated people, never want what they have. They're always frustrated. But then they're always doing whatever the hell they did to cause that. Then they're more frustrated. So they never get to solving that frustration problem. Anytime you feel frustrated, that's the key or the emotional key that you have turned on. I feel frustrated. The moment I feel frustrated, I recognize I have to look at what I did to to have that hit there. Then I have to go, this is actually what I want. I want to hit to the right. And once I do that, then I'm like, ah, oh, there's many ways to correct things. I don't want to hit to the right. Oh, it's terrible. 
That's frustration. What is fear? Fear is in motion. So everybody's still caught on frustration. I just turned around. We're doing something else. All right. Fear. What is the, what is the emotion of fear? Being the key, when I turn on fear, where does it ultimately end up? Paralysis. Fear leads to withdrawing. Withdrawal or isolation. Which leads to no action. When you... Actually, it's... It is. It starts out as scare. Like, there's a difference between scared. So, if I, if I do this, you have a response. You have to program yourself into going, ah, over time. Right now, it's just, oh my God, what is that? That's sound. So, a scare tactic that gets programmed, once it gets programmed, like if I can get you to respond a certain way by yelling at you, I now can program fear into it. So fear, when it's, in, when it's in an emotional response, leads you to withdrawing from the thing that you're afraid of and isolating yourself from the thing that you're afraid of. <sighs> Ultimately, fear over time leads to you not being able to do that thing. You can't. If you keep programming fear, you get hormonal responses, and then you start sweating, and then, oh my God, I can't do it. You can't. And seeing people overcome fear is a crazy machination. What's the way to deal with fear? You have to go do the thing that you're afraid of. You have to. You can spend the rest of your life going towards fear, and your life will demonstrably change. Could you not use another emotion to, <clears throat> to unlock that? Could you use anger to fit into that hole? Possibly. I don't know what emotion is the right emotion to use. I'm just going to expose what emotions are. Fear leads to not action. So the only way, oh, the only way to overcome frustration is to accept and acknowledge what happened. Then you can solve the problem. Anger leads to no action. Only way to overcome, or sorry, fear leads to no action. Only way to overcome fear is to step into it. Like if I'm afraid to talk to women, I have to go do this. <laughs> if I go do it, what happens to me? Right here, I'm like, oh my God, I'm sweating BBs. The moment I do this, the thing that I thought was going to happen, it's not as bad. It was bad, though. But yeah. Horrible. <laughs> Everything that you're afraid of, I guarantee, is not as bad as what you think. It's much worse in this meaning-making mechanism in your brain. Oh, my God, we're going to die. We're getting shot at. To a seal, it's like, oh, he, I know exactly where he is. He shot, and he missed. Tom, in relation to fear, I'm not sure if you said this. It's an acronym. Have you heard the acronym for fear? False evidence appearing real. Yeah. I've made it real. I have made that experience real. I've endorsed it. I've even got you to help me endorse the thing. You know, like, all, you know, I actually believe this to be true. It's not. All Islamic people are bad. And they cause me a fear response. And I can move into it. But it causes that because I've programmed myself. Okay. Like, you know, afraid to go down South Chicago. It's real. There's a whole part of the country that can't go into South Chicago. There's people that live in South Chicago. Have you all done business down there yet? Okay, so yeah. <laughs> so there's people that can't. My, my dad drives way around, four-hour drive around. He goes, I'm not going through South Chicago because people die there every day. It's not that bad. Yeah, it's not. I just went. 
It's bad, but it's not bad. You just don't get off certain exits at nighttime and you're good. So all that, all that is programmed. It's not actually real. It has happened several times, but then I escalate that in my mind to mean every time. And if I do that, I'm going to die. So fear of heights. Anybody afraid of heights? Okay. Like really afraid. Do it. You won't be. What are you afraid of? Do you know? Dying. You're afraid to die. So what you have to do is go do that. No. <laughs> you have to go to a high place, like do a rappel. I put a lot of people, all my clients through a rappel. You go to that high place and, you know, I, the funny thing, Ed, but once somebody has the fear response, they're not listening to what you're saying. Yeah. So I take a bunch of clients up there, and I'm like, we're going to rappel down, and we're going to climb back up. The people that are afraid, I can tell them 150 times that we're going to put on a little climbing harness, and you have a little you know, rappel device. I can tell them 100 times how to do that. Did they hear a word I said? Their hands are going like this, they're sweating. I'm like, man, I, you look like an athlete. Why are you sweating? You haven't even moved. They're programming them, themselves not to do anything because fear leads to this. So I'm just keeping them moving. I hook up the device for them. And then I hook the, my device on lower and I repel down. And then, because I don't want them to put it on by themselves because I know they didn't listen to a damn word I said. <laughs> So I tell them 100 times what to do. They didn't hear me. So I go down first, and then they come over. It's like getting rained on. There's so much sweat coming off that person. <laughs> it's crazy. I'm like, oh, this is crazy. <laughs> it's 10 feet, 10 feet. You can do it. I'm going to die. I'm going to leave my kids. To this moment where I'm now 100% committed is the critical point. Once they get over the ledge, what happens to their body? They relax. They're like, oh. Then they come down. They're like, oh my God, that was the greatest experience I ever had. They, come, they overcome fear, but you have to go do that. So, fear of heights has been a thing for me, so I've always forced myself to do something. So, I thought the ultimate would be jumping out of an airplane. And literally, all the way up there, I, my knees were shaking. Like, I was like, dude, I'm going to freaking die. This is terrible. And, uh, and when I got to the door, and it was time to go out, and I looked out. I literally accepted the fact that I was going to die. Yeah. I, just, I was like, I'm dead. Shoo! <laughs> <laughs> but it's so high that it's above height. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's different when you can see the, yeah. like, I know I'm going to hit that yeah. rock right there. But yeah, jumping like, out of airplanes, so, it's so high, you're like, oh, my God, I have no control. But the experience of, did you get the experience of falling? I always feel like it's a chaotic event getting out of an airplane. Like you go, yeah. like I don't even know if I'm falling, and then all of a sudden you're under canopy, and you're like, oh, that wasn't bad. Mm-hmm. Then you're like, oh, did you? But it feels like you're laying on the ground. Right. It's like a 100, 100 mile an hour wind. It feels like you're just laying face flat on the ground. Yeah. Yeah. It's nice and warm on the ground and cold up there. People don't anticipate that. that. Yeah. So it's never what you think it is. It's always different. Fear leads to no action. The only way to overcome it is to take action. So Usually you need help. Yes, sir. Can, can you apply that to their situation? Possibly, but I didn't get fear. I didn't get no action. I got another emotional response. Okay, so anger. Anger leads to what? Action. Action. Anger, 100% of the time, leads to action. Everybody says, don't have anger. Don't get pissed. It's the same thing. Everybody has to master anger. However, anger leads to action, which leads to another condition. What's somebody that is in anger, 
has been angry over time. That's actually not. When somebody has been angry for a while, what's that condition that they're in? They've been angry. They're, they get spun up. Once they get to this condition, what would you call that condition? What was it? Rage. It leads to rage. Hold on. Let me... Excuse me for a second. This is looking at emotions again, just in case y'all get off track. Anger experience leads to action. Are we dying? I was going to make sure it didn't fall on okay. Anger leads to immediate action. Anger kept unchecked leads to rage. Has anybody experienced somebody that's been in a state of rage? Yeah. Can they stop? No. They cannot. But what are they trying to do? This is where anger eventually leads you, if left unchecked. What is it? Yeah, sort of. To destruct the force. I know I can't use a preposition at the end of a sentence, but I don't know how to say it differently. It, anger left unchecked has the intent to destroy what I'm angry at. If I stay angry for a, period, a long period of time, I'm now committed to destroying the thing that I'm angry at. If I'm angry at you, if left unchecked, I'm going to destroy you. That's what it's designed to do. Anger left unchecked will destroy the thing that it's angry at. But it gets you in action very quickly. I actually like anger, but I can turn it off. Which was your reaction in that scenario? Anger. Yep. Take action, fire back. Yep. Take action. Once you're in a state of anger, you, you're immediately which solving the problems. Which you're angry at. Yeah, but not really. But no. yeah. So where does that? What happens with anxiety? What's the next thing? If I'm feeling anxious, what's the next thing that happens? So I've experienced a problem. I've grabbed my key of anxiety and I've gone. Chick. I've turned on anxiety. What's the next thing that happens? No, they're distinctly different. Ang or anxiety leads to what? Paralysis, I can't spell it. Leads to paralysis. <clears throat> What's the next thing that happens? <laughs> Medication. <laughs> Avoid. Anxiety leads to avoidance. If you want to avoid something, be anxious about it. If you want to avoid going somewhere, be really anxious about it. Then you can sell everybody around you that we shouldn't do it. They'll buy it, and you have avoided it. But you got to realize, man, it could go south. I don't know. I think I have a bad feeling about this. That's anxiety speaking. It's trying to avoid the thing that it's anxious. That's the design of anxiety. Excitement. What is the next step of excitement? 
action. What's the next thing after action? Experiencing what you're excited about. <laughs> Where does excitement lead? Huh? Pleasure. Pleasure. Excitement leads to pleasure. Everybody. Th it doesn't lead to an outcome that kind of, you know, you can be excited about something, you can take action and you're like, oh shit. It may not be the outcome yeah. that you want, yeah. but if you're excited, the commitment of excitement is pleasure. It's committed to receiving pleasure from the thing that's exci it's excited about. It may not be the outcome that you want. So be very careful that you create, that you're conscious of the excitement that you create around yourself or people because you have to be very clear that's the outcome that you want. Because you can get somebody excited about doing something that's not helpful and they'll get pleasure from it. It's a truth. So be very, that's a, uh, an emotion that you, if you're in a leadership role, be very careful what you're getting them excited to do. Just, you gotta understand that. Cause they're gonna get an action and they're gonna get fulfillment from it. And then once they get fulfillment from it, it's hard to pull them away from it. God, don't do that anymore. I've already programmed myself to be excited about it. So be very conscious of when you use this one. It may not be what you do all the time with people, is get them excited about an outcome. They're like, yeah, we're gonna get that, yeah. If they don't get it, they're gonna keep trying to get it. So it's hard to pivot somebody who's excited, unless they learn how to turn it off. Well, that didn't work, okay. Drop that, pull that out, it's gone. Most people can't do that because they program themselves. Excitement is cool, but like all these emotions, who turned this one on in the first place? You did. If you can turn it on, you can turn it off. Turn on fear if you want to not do anything. Turn it off if you want to do something. Turn on anger if you want to get in action, but turn it off before you get in the state of rage. Turn on anxiety or turn it off, quit and recognize it and turn it off. Or you can create anxiety. How do you create anxiety? Since you all put this on the board. How do you create it? Are you all anxious about what we're talking about? Because they're worried they're going to. I don't know what they're worried about, really. It's they, they're anxious about making the phone calls. Not getting what you want. As soon as I become anxious, I talk to people all the time, like, how many phone calls do you make? Six. That's Pathetic. paralysis. Empathetic. Absolutely. And it's like, well, why? And you ask these questions, why? Well, I don't know the other person on the other end. They're like, well, if you follow, you just follow the system, you don't have to worry about it. I feel like anxiety, as soon as someone's anxious about something, if they'll look at what, you know, the phones. I'm anxious about making a phone call. Well, there's a solution already in place for that. It's called a script. You read it, and there's nothing that they can say to me that's going to hurt my feelings from that point, and they're either going to accept or not and move on to the next one. So one way out of anxiety, the one is you've got to recognize it clearly. The other one is to take action. Take action with the solution that's already in place for that anxiety. But how do you make yourself anxious? It was the question you said we make ourselves anxious. Yeah, that's what I was leading to. It was interesting how, the, how he took that, though. So how do you overcome anxiety is what? Action. Take action. Make sure the action that you're taking has a particular direction that it's going to go. So one way to overcome anxiety if you don't have a clear path forward is to do something else for a moment. Like, well, I'm really anxious about uh, getting on the phone. Go do push-ups. So now I'm engaged in something viscerally that has nothing to do with what I'm anxious about. So it drops that emotional response. And then now I have a, I'm responding differently. 
and then get your script out. And I'm just using that as an analogy. But anxiety, is, we go. I would say make, make 10 or 15 phone calls, go have a coffee, go for a run, and then come back to it, it's not a big deal. Which is interesting because most of the time on Boston, somebody says, I just I don't want to get on a phone call. And then they say, well, I got on them, and I made it, come down, I made 50 of them. No big deal. Yeah. Yeah. Do it anyway. Yeah, just do it anyway. Get in, get in motion. The opposite of paralysis is motion. So the, you got to find us. So you're saying that embrace the avoidance for a short period of time. Change the focus. <clears throat> Anxiety when you're feeling it is calling, causing you to be paralyzed. If you notice that, well, I'm really anxious. So whatever your anxious response is. You know, your hands are twitching or you don't want to go do that thing. Either grab the script out and not really think about the outcome. Just follow this script. That's getting you into motion in the in the in the the presence of anxiety. Or, gosh, I just mm, go do push ups, go out in the hall and scream. The result of anxiety is avoidance, right? Yes. So what you're doing is taking a temporary avoidance and coming back to it. No one can do it. I see where you're going with that. So it's not allowing anxiety to cause you to avoid the thing that you're doing. And I, I know why your brain went there. It's just one is I'm anxious. If, I'm, if I stay anxious, I'm never going to pick this up. I don't want to pick this up. I'm committed to avoiding doing that. Oh, damn, I can't do that. Turn, do something else. The anxiety drops. Now I can get back into this without anxiety. So. I think the key word you said in there would be for a moment. For a moment. For a moment. Yeah. Yeah, don't travel for weeks. Yeah. Because that's the avoidance. You've now, you've caused that to happen. So uh, before we move on, what opened up for you in that first experience, this first conversation that we've had? What about emotions has opened up for you? Yes, sir. Wait, you had a question? Go ahead. Oh, okay. So what I was going to say was what I've noticed in my own life, like through sports and different things like that, with regards to anxiety, it usually is that there's a situation that I believe I don't have the skill set. Just overall, um, I'm not good enough for that. So if I feel anxiety, uh, talking to someone, it's because, oh, I feel like I'm lower status. I'm not good enough to talk to them. Or if there's an, an action that I have to take, I'm not good enough at that skill set. So there's that aspect of like, okay, I can kind of like turn off the anxiety just enough and then pick up again before it's allowed to seep in and then prevent me from taking action. Or with regards to calls, for example, I could just like acknowledge it and be like, okay, like I just acknowledge I might suck at this, but the only way to get better at it and lessen that anxiety is just get better at phone Repetitions. calls. Repetitions. Yeah, having those having those reps in. So like I might feel anxious about a competition, but know that if I keep practicing, I'll get less anxious because it's like I put in the work for that. That's right. How many emotions did he have there? Did anybody pick up on that? That wasn't just anxiety. You have a bunch of keys working there, my friend. Distinguishing which key that you have turned on is essential. So even though you may solve the anxiety one, you have the fear one, or you have the, the woe is me conversation, which is a, an emotional response. I'm not enough. So if I'll just bring that one up because you brought it up. So the I'm not enough conversation, what emotion is that? Okay. Self-pity. Self-pity. Pity. Self-pity. If I have self-pity, where does that, what's the outcome of self-pity? No action. No action. No action. No action. No action. Self-destruction. Leads to what? Everybody has this. Self-hatred. Depression. I guess the end result is you don't get what you want. The thing you think you're not good enough for. 
So where does it lead to? This is yeah. the outcome of depression. Yeah. Destruction. Self-destruction. Never improving. If you have self-loathe, not enough, self-pity, it causes you to be depressed about the thing that you're trying to do. So whether it's working out, whether it's competition, whether it's sales, God, I'm just not good enough. I don't know enough. They're better than me. All that stuff around that conversation leads to a depressed environment. How can you grow from a non-nourishing environment? You can't. Well, yeah, you have to stop the chain. So if you wanted to be a good athlete, I'm just not as good as that other person. I'm just not as good as that other person. I don't nourish what it takes to get better. Eventually, I get to this outcome. I cannot improve. Because this emotional response is there. How do you break self-loathing? Love yourself. How the fuck do you do that? So is somebody who's self-loathing good at anything? Nope. Everybody understand that? Yep. If you have it in one area of your life, it's transcendent. You can't be self-loathing and be good at something. Personally, whenever, I mean, we've all experienced that. Whenever I've not been good enough for something, my response was always to go find someone I feel like is really good at it and just find out what they're doing and start doing that. That's how I've overcome that. But how do you get people to do that? You have to acknowledge the shortcoming. Yeah. Yourself. Like not just saying you're not good enough. You have to actually be like. You realize I suck at this. This is what it is. And I want to be good at it. Go find someone who's good at it and do what they've done to get there. So, you know, recognizing that I, a uh, uh, couple analogies and if they hit, they hit. Recognizing that I'm fat isn't self-loathing. It's just, I have a problem. So what I said before, emotions and problems self arise at the same time. If I recognize the problem, I'm overweight, or I, but I want to get faster, I recognize, I recognize that I'm slow. I'm not loathing in it. I'm not pitying myself for being slow. If, if I recognize the problem, how many solutions become available? Darn near infinite. Can you use another emotion to switch that off, like anger? And you get pissed off about it and it creates action? <coughs> yes. So. That's who I am. I'm not enough, all right? So, so, so the key, so this is a, an important conversation. One is because Joe said something about it early. He used different terminology. At the end of his little introduction speech, he was talking about this subject. I don't know if you recognized it. So I'm not enough. I pity myself or whatever. How do you deal with this? That's what you guys just asked. How do I get rid of it? You have to isolate the problem. Always, always, you yes. Anger is a way to get rid of problem and emotion. <clears throat> Once you accept the problem, then you can see the solutions and, and you don't tie the emotion to it. Yes, and I don't know if that is understandable to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> what is the self-loathing person? Who pities themselves? Who's, who's authentic enough to have that conversation? And after this conversation, we'll take a break. Okay. It's exactly this. Okay. So go ahead and do your magic. I <laughs> 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 open the door. Thank you so much for your therapy. So put your food in magic on. Okay. <laughs> because the funny thing is, Tom, is before I started this job, um, the number one thing that probably kept me from 
being all in at the very beginning is that saying I'm not enough. In the fear of everything surrounding, which caused depression, which still to this day, I'm not as good as I should be at this job because I always have that doubt. I mean, I come into this room and I... By the way, I want to acknowledge what you're doing right now. That's fucking huge. So you saying that, you saying that in front of somebody is rare and it's huge and I am committed to hammering you. So you got, you got dents and it probably would hurt. It probably will hurt. So up, no, bottom line up front, it's probably going to hurt to hear what's going to happen here. Okay. I didn't mean to stop the piss stream. No, no. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I get it. There's depression there. What are you depressed about? Where? Where? Um, Depression doesn't want to seek itself. It doesn't want to make evident what is depressing you. It will avoid this conversation at all costs. It'll talk in generalities and it will rarely go to what really happened that caused depression or caused not enough depression and not being good at shit. It's the dynamic, emotional dynamic around people who are depressed is they never get to it. They never want to experience that thing that caused them to be depressed. So what is it? I think it's mainly, I know we have like, when everybody dies, like, like I know Tyler talks about legacy. I think my biggest fear is I'm going to leave and there's not going to be a person at my funeral. Okay. So I didn't leave a legacy. First, I want everybody witnessing this to forgive me up front. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you. Who cares? Well, I do. No, you don't. I guess I'm not following. I know. You don't care. If you cared, then you would. Change. Yep. That's what's depressing but you didn't answer my question. Because depression wants to never address what happened. It wants to talk around it. It wants to get the listeners emotionally involved with something else so that the person doesn't have to address what happened. You see where he went with that? It's just what happens with depressing people. Not that you're depressing. Well, some people say I am. <laughs> Only if they're depressing themselves. So Joe doesn't see you as that. Otherwise, he wouldn't be around you. The sole reason why I remain friends with Joe is that condition. He only surrounds himself, like he said, with those people. So he sees something, and he's going to keep seeing it while you don't. So what happened? that caused you to be there. Don't put this on national TV.